Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 58 of the Old Men Magic Podcast. It is Monday, September 18th, 2023. Thank you all for joining us today for some casual cardboard conversation. Today, we have another cycle of budget old frame cards that we want to discuss. We also have some personal commander issues to discuss. No big commander news. It's just going to be us talking about some commander decks we're building. But before we get started with today's official segments, I have something from Twitter I wanted to show you, Alex. I saw this when I was scrolling through the Twitter feed yesterday, and it is a deck that inspired me. Uh Oh, it is this deck in this post right here. Dakota Clark posted this. Pricing Manager Buyer NRG Series. Your round one opponent at the modern RCQ pulls up with this. What do you do? Yes, this actually happened today, and they actually won two matches. So this is what somebody brought to a modern regional qualifier. And for the people who can't see, the people who are just listening, this is an old school deck. And the reason this inspired me is because like, this is very similar to the old school, to an old school kind of blue red counter burn deck that I was thinking about building. You know, we were talking last week about Blood Moon and how I'm like, can't afford dual lands, just playing Blood Moon. That's going to be old school for me. One old school deck is going to be a budget mono green deck with maybe a splash of black for mind twist or maybe a splash of white for balance. I could also throw in Terror or Swords to Plowshares. A second old school deck I wanted to build is also going to be a budget deck. Counter Burn. Bolts, Fireballs, Counter Spells, and then Blood Moon to screw people with dual lands. Maybe some Energy Flux to irritate people who have a bunch of Moxes. Uh, but I didn't think to myself, oh, I can build an old school budget deck that maybe I could also play in modern so the deck i'm looking at right here is uh well in blue all these four cards are printed in modern You're apparently me. they're all currently <laughs> modern legal uh four flying men a mahamodi cyblast clone counterspell remove soul in red you have a shatter three blood moons a couple fireballs four earthquakes four bolts four dragon whelps and he has islands dragon whelps surprises me city of brass here you go. Dragon Wolf was in Dominaria Remastered. <laughs> okay. Where was Flying? The two things that can surprise me. Flying Men and Cyblast. If you pull those up right now on Scryfall, for instance. I'm pretty I'm sure I knew that both of those had been reprinted. They were reprinted in like a Time Shifted or something. Yeah. Time Shifted is where Psionic Blast from. Because I knew t- Psionic Blast was reprinted, but it also wasn't pre-modern legal. Um Yes. Yeah, Flying Men, also time-shifted, okay. time-spiral, time-shifted, modern legal. So I was like, this is awesome. Uh, I've been thinking about, you know, I'm getting to the point where I'm not quite ready to start buying any modern cards or trying to play modern cards necessarily. But I'm starting to dip my toes into some of the modern sets. I'm looking around. I I'm see watching- what you're saying. I'm watching a little bit of modern gameplay on and YouTube. You, and if you make a deck like this, exactly. then as you want, you can start to sub in one or two other like newer modern cards that you aren't familiar with one at a time. Use it as like your basis. I think that's a cool idea. And I haven't even thought until now about, you know, building myself a deck and going to a local LGS on and modern night and, and, and playing some modern to try to get to know the cards because I don't want to buy a bunch of new frame cards. I'm still yep. in the process where I have a bunch of old frame cards that I want to pick up and I want to focus on that. Right. But if there are enough old frame original cards that are also modern legal that you can make a deck that might actually win a game or two here and there, this would be great. I could build a deck that's both old school and modern playable. Yeah, and that's only, what I'm psyched about. The only bad thing is your opponent still is going to have to explain all of their cards to you, probably. <laughs> that is true, but it's still better. I, it's better if I get to go there with a deck and play as opposed to like not having a modern legal deck at all. Yeah, I know. And just like going and trying to watch other people play and like 
interrupting their gameplay and being like, can you tell me what that does? That's not going to fly. People will kick no, me that's out cool, of the OGS. So I thought that was sweet. I, I thought that's hilarious also that he won a couple games. <laughs> Mountain Dew Code Red, too. It goes well with the rest of with the that deck. Code Red. So those yeah. MTG guys, they're pounding it. I'll tell you what, though. That mo- that MTG, uh, sorry, not MTG Dew Code Red. Mountain Dew Code Red is so fucking good, man. <laughs> I drink like I drink like one every five years because it's terrible. I've never had that. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> what? Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it is i mean it's garbage well, i'm curious you might spit it out like it depends on your palate but like i can just <laughs> i have a major sweet tooth i can just like funnel sugar into my throat so this is the kind of stuff that i love but it's 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 excellent that's 10 good. out of 10 mountain dew code that's all right that's, Noted. My, that's my review <laughs> no well i have a follow-up if you oh a follow-up if you okay. want to hear one I had no idea. I don't know if this is interesting. We talked about R- Mirage for a minute the other day. We were talking about the Mirage starter decks, and I didn't have any stats for like printing in front of me. So I looked up one or two things that I thought were worth mentioning. Uh, Mirage released November 1st, 1996. Estimated print run of 400 million cards. Holy okay. smokes. Uh, I was just I was just communicating with somebody on Twitter today because uh, they were like, why are... And uh, why are Arabian Nights cards so much more expensive than the other four horsemen? Because yeah. they're picking up old school stuff. And I think they maybe they just started looking at the prices of Arabian Nights and they've been buying legends and stuff. And I was like, oh, it's it's print runs. That's like the Arabian Night the print, print run of the dark. Yeah, the Arabian print run, if my, the numbers I had were correct, I think it was 5 million. Something like and, that, yeah. And then the Antiquities was like 15 million. Legends was 35 million. And the dark, I think, was seventy-five million. I thought Legends was more than that, but maybe I'm just uh, forgetting because of the, like the big set size. It changes the number of cards printed and stuff. I could also be wrong. Those are the numbers that I had written down. Uh-huh. But even if I'm wrong, it's in the ballpark. It's way, way lower than what you just said for Mirage. Four hundred yeah. million. Yeah. yeah. Well, revised. The number I've heard thrown around is two hundred or so or more, but I don't think they have a good number. And then fourth edition edition is like even more than this. I think fourth edition. I should look it up before I say anything. But I was going to say it was like seven hundred million or something. So um, yeah, it's it's going to be difficult to ever get those. Uh... But see, we, what about modern sets though? I mean, since then they've made sets that have been that big or bigger. And the modern sets, like I don't even know what the printing runs are. People have estimated them based on like like available slots and things, but yeah. I'm not really sure. Uh, well, we brought this up last week because we were talking about certain Mirage cards that had spiked in price, and they're really reverting to their pre pre spike prices, right? And I think I talked about how, you know, that gave us a pretty good idea of what the fair market price is for these cards. It would be it's going to be hard to to spike them. The, I guess to summarize it, it's the supply massively outstrips the demand. Uh, any spike yeah. you see in these Mirage cards, like it, it pretty rapidly corrects. Yeah, it has to be something that's like really in demand. Really like in demand. So it's going to be difficult to like see these Mirage cards as an, any sort of investment vehicle for the future with a print run of 400 million. Yes, as the years go on, if magic continues to grow... You will have more and more people come into the hobby. They will want that that old that old printing, the original printing. Some subset of players and collectors will always want the original printing. But when you're talking about print run of 400 million, something that's 10 times what Legends was. It's, and know. it's later on when conceivably, you know, people were, you know, maybe keeping these a little, you know, more yeah, carefully you- or more deliberately. We were sleeving our cards by that time. Not not all of our cards all of the time, but yeah, people bought people had ultra pro sleeves by the time Mirage came out. Well, okay. So, anyways, um oh, by the way, this says 500 million for fourth edition. Uh so I was wondering about the the sealed decks kind of particularly. I started looking some of this up. Um Mirage began the first official block, one large expansion expansion followed by two smaller expansions. Um, 
And Ice Age had starter decks before this, but it wasn't like an official block yet. Uh, so this is the first time they had like a, a real block. Um, they had the starter decks from Mirage. And I, I was starting to look this up because um, I was wondering how long they did it. They eventually changed what they called starter decks. Now they then they called them tournament packs. So they had starter decks, uh, you know, up through you know revised fourth edition, Ice Age Mirage, fifth edition, and Tempest was the last official starter deck. And then in Urza's Saga, they began calling it a tournament pack, and they changed it from sixty cards to seventy five cards. Um, then that lasted through 6th edition, Mercadian Masks, several more, on to Shards of Alara in 2008. And that seems to be the last time they did, you know, these sort of starter deck type sealed decks. Then they, I guess since then they've moved on to either like the, you know, draft boosters for sealed or having pre-constructed decks. Cons. Yeah. yeah. Um, other thing that was interesting in here, it said at one point that starter decks were the only sources of basic lands until 7th edition boosters. And oh. I was like, that is crazy! Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I I knew when we were buying boosters, you know, you had to go to the starter decks to get the lands. Yeah. The first magic I bought, I bought a starter deck plus some boosters. The boosters And I remember that like too was a concept, but for some reason mm -hmm. I sort of misremembered maybe like thinking like a booster pack gave you like one land at the back or something. Mm -hmm. But that's probably just because of more of how new packs are, and it made me think that. Um, okay, then. Yeah, that was about all with that. Um, the enchantments from Eldrain, too, also I wanted to mention, they uh, they are not in a separate product. I uh, saw that, they, yeah. They have a special slot in draft set and collector boosters. You can get them. Um, although the confetti foil versions are only in collector's boosters. Someone posted a confetti foil blood moon. Okay, I wonder if it's the same one I saw. Because, uh, I mean, they probably all look the same. But this one was very, it was just a flat, it was a still image. He wasn't like, he or she wasn't moving it back and forth or anything. It wasn't a GIF or a video. And I saw that, and in the post, I can't remember exactly what they said, but it was positive about, you know, how good it looked. And I thought to myself, this just looks terrible. Like, <laughs> this is absolute garbage. Why Looks would like anybody someone just like sprayed like? Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> and they're probably currently selling for more than a blood moon from the dark. I'm sure. Probably yeah, because that's it. Seems pretty rare now if you think about it like that. It's only in a certain slot. Yeah. In collector boosters, um, and then it has to be the foil version of that card in the slot. People don't buy it. Uh, if if you if you want to spend a hundred bucks on a blood moon, just go go pick up a near mint copy I don't from want the dark. The, the fruity pebbles throw up version. Yeah, well, I mean, what I should you buy? I mean, it's not go. that bad. It was okay. Like it was terrible. Know, if I opened one, I'd be stoked, but I'd also sell it. I, I'd be stoked so I could immediately trade it in for store credit to get something that I wanted. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Yeah, I did see that too. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to mention it because I remember we were confused about it last week. We didn't have the answer yet, but I watched some people open in collector boosters online and I oh. saw them pull uh, Enchanting Tales. Yeah, the collector boosters. Okay. So let's get into the segment one, Alex. This is the first official segment of episode 58 of the Old Men Magic podcast. Today... We are going all the way back to June 1998. We're going to discuss some cards from Magic's 14th expansion set. It's the last set in Tempest Block. That set is Exodus. It is a 143 card set. Did I pronounce Exodus correctly? Yeah. The set is Exodus. I'll say that again. 143 card set. It includes 55 commons, 44 uncommons, and 44 rares. Interesting note, it was the first set to use color coding to indicate card rarity. Four of the 143 cards in this set are part of a mega cycle 
Alex, not just a cycle, but a mega cycle of cards mega. known as the retrievers. It's a it's mega a cycle game. because the cards were printed over more than one set. Okay. So there's four of them printed in Exodus. The fifth was printed actually in a previous set. What's the precedent and for using mega to describe things that bridge two different areas? Is that a don't, thing? I don't in, know, Alex. Then, hmm, hmm. I'm you not you sure your, how I feel about that. Do you got your Oxford English Dictionary in front of you? I'll, I'll look it up for next week. I'm not sure how I feel about mega, though, describing something like mega sounds like it's bigger than normal. It should be 10 it cards does. instead of five card cycle. It does. Well, I guess in some sense it is bigger than normal because the number of sets that it spans is bigger than normal, but True. the number yeah. of cards in the cycle yeah. isn't bigger than normal. Today we're going to review this mega cycle. Each of the retrievers is a 2-2 creature that can return one type of card from your graveyard to your hand. The first <clears throat> retriever is not flying men. It is treasure hunter. Ah. Treasure hunter. Treasure hunter. Is an uncommon from Exodus. It was also printed in 10th edition in the list. It is two colorless, one white, two two, summon townsfolk. When Treasure Hunter comes into play, you may return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. It has a rating of 3.680 on Gatherer, current market price of 24 cents. So this Ooh. is a budget card. I will say this has a higher rating than I thought it would have on Gather. I was kind of surprised by that high rating. And I saw this card and I thought to myself, if you wanted this effect in an old frame deck, is this really something that would be worth running? What else could you run instead? I mean, there is this card that I'm going to type in. No. Nah. <laughs> And if Rudy didn't have 7,000 copies of this card, maybe it would be cheaper. But we live in a world where he does have 7,000 copies. Look at MTG stocks. Screwing me Oh, jeez. They know Back what time to do this. I know. The plug on us. I was actually using MTG stocks earlier today, and I was using it last night. No problems. As soon as we start going, I get internal server errors. Our Giving Archaeologist is the first card that came to mind. So this was printed in Antiquities. It is a reserve list card. And it has a current market price of $229.49. So, you know, while it may be better than Treasure Hunter, uh, it's 100 times more expensive. Did I get that right? No, I didn't get that right. More than 100 times more expensive. Tw hold on, 24 cents times 10. 240 times 10. 24. It's a thousand times more expensive. So the archaeologist, you get to use this ability over and over again. Pay two white tap to bring one artifact from your graveyard back to your hand. It's not just when the card comes into play. You out there, the listeners, the viewers can decide whether or not you think this ability to do this multiple times is worth uh, yeah. An extra $229, essentially. <laughs> Plus, you're into five mana to get your first artifact back with this yeah. guy. The other that guy. Is true. It's a burst that's quick as opposed to slower and more reusable. One use, short game to bring back a combo piece or to, to hit a combo. You know, something you only want to do once. The treasure hunter is actually way better. If you're playing a slow game, archaeologist would be better. But it's price prohibitive. Next thing I thought about are giving and find. Oh, okay. Are giving and find. This was printed originally in Weatherlight. Yes, Weatherlight. It is an instant for one white return target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. So it's only one mana. It's an instant, as opposed to a creature, you don't have the body associated with it, but, you know, uh, 
who cares? You're probably not playing the treasure hunter for the 2-2 body anyways. And this guy yeah. can bring back en enchantments as well. And it's 76 cents. Yeah. Some of the other cards in this cycle have interesting creature types, but not really the treasure hunter. I thought they were all townsfolk. Oh, oh. Uh, the, the black one's a zombie. Oh, yeah, that's right. Everything else from Exodus is a townsfolk. Really? Interesting. Yeah, which I don't know that there's a whole lot of townsfolk synergy. And I don't know if townsfolk are now just... If it's changed. Humans. It's changed. You would think they would just be humans. And uh, people do run decks, I think, in, especially in modern, called like humans or five-color humans. I think I've seen stuff about this. Treasure Hunter now just says creature human. Yeah, he's just a human. I don't even know there's a whole lot of human synergy, though. There might be. I haven't gotten into all the modern humans. I haven't seen a card that says give all your humans plus this. Or yeah, I can't think of anything that interacts with just humans like that in old frame. So <laughs> Treasure Hunter, it's cool, but I mean, I think almost in every single case where I would want this ability, I would simply run the Argivian Find yeah. instead. Yeah, I think you're right. There's some other things too. So Treasure Hunter, Argivian Find, you can do this just in white if you wanted to splash blue into your neck into your deck maybe you don't but if you do there are some other cool options that you could add there too that won't break the bank reconstruction is one i didn't put that here but yes that's a classic reconstruction you can get the original antiquities reconstructions too still very very cheap and i think i looked at that but it's not pre-modern legal if i'm correct i think they stopped it after like revised they did yeah Antiquities pre-modern. Antiquities pre-modern doesn't have the set symbol on it. Really? Uh, yeah. I don't know if you ever noticed that about yours. I thought this was funny too because I was browsing Twitter right, like a month or two ago. Somebody who I follow posted their, they just picked up some reconstructions from antiquities and they were like, are they all like this? <laughs> and, and I responded and I said, yeah, they are actually. Cause I had the same thought when mine came in the mail. I was like, did I just get like a four of some sort of misprint? Is that the only no. antiquities like that or are there more? It's the only one I've come across. It's the only one I'm aware of. Looks good in that black border too. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, and the antiquity symbol, the anvil is not present huh. for some reason on the reconstruction card. Uh, but antique, uh, Reconstruction, you can use if you want to splash in blue. You can also run Rootwater Diver. Rootwater Diver, like our giving archaeologist, gives you... Oh. No, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. I was going to say it gives you the ability to do it multiple times, but that's not true. Rootwater Diver is one blue, one one. Summon oh, to sacrifice him. Tap and sacrifice it to return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. So only one man at a cast... But unless you have some sort of haste enabler out, you need to wait another turn. Not a not a huge deal. Another one is Hannah Ship's Navigator. Talked about her before, which I really like. I want to I want to find a deck to play this card in. Creature Legend: One colorless, one white, one blue, one two. You can pay one colorless, one white, one blue. Tap. To return target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand, like the are giving the archaeologist, you can use this ability over and over again. Unlike the are giving the archaeologist, you can also use it to bring back enchantments. Also, it's only a dollar and ninety-two cents. Fair price. Sense? Fair price. Been reprinted a lot. Yeah. Get that original. Yeah, when I say a dollar ninety-two, that's for the original invasion. You can get them cheaper. Commander Masters, Commander Masters three forty, fourteen cents. But that's the first one I saw. Treasure Hunter. Other things I do. At there are other things that I would play. Oh yeah, yeah. And instead if we're, of instead of Treasure Hunter, we're starting to talk about splashing colors in. I mean, at that point, you know, you could play like you know regrowth type effects out of green to just bring back general cards well you don't know. get crazy oh. now Alex. <laughs> there's a lot of options <laughs> let's go back just to white i'd play our giving find that, that's what i decided yeah. 
And I was looking for other things in the pre-modern format in the old frame world that can have that same effect. Is the can you think the fact that it's an instant is not really ever going to help you other than the fact that you could do it on your opponent's turn so that you could untap that mana then on your next yeah, turn. That's, that's like, big though. Yeah. Oh, that is. Yeah, yeah. I just other than that, like the fact that it's an instant isn't really. I mean, there are some other reasons why you might want it to be an instant too. Like there are cards that you can use to tutor for instance or okay. bring back instance, so yeah, yeah. stuff like that too. Okay. Second one in the, I was going to say in the town folk cycle, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the retriever cycle. They happen to be townsfolk. Second one is Scrivener. There's multiple Scriveners. We're looking at the OG Scrivener printed in Exodus, also printed in Odyssey. I like that Odyssey. Short story by Herman Melville, I believe. What'd you say? I said short story by Herman Melville, oh. I believe. The Scrivener. Does that look like Herman Melville? Bartleby the Scrivener. Hmm. No, that's... Yeah, there we go. Bartleby the Scrivener. That was the story. Uncommon from Exodus, also printed in Odyssey. Four colorless, one blue. This is an expensive one, mana-wise. Summon Townsfolk, 2-2. Two, two. When Scrivener comes into play, you may return target instant or interrupt card from your graveyard to your hand. Okay, so here we go. Our giving fine synergy. Directly applicable. 3.059 on Gatherer. Current market price of 20 cents. Now, I understand why they assigned a higher casting cost to this card than they did to the previous. Because its ability is on average just much more powerful because of what it helps you get back yeah it reloads your counter spells but it's still so expensive five mana five friggin mana i don't know if i'd ever run this i thought to myself if i wanted something in the old frame world that has a similar effect is there something better that i could run i don't know first card that came to mind is a card that I always want to use. And I've been putting this card in decks, like in the playtesting phase, since I first pulled one from a pack in the 90s. But I never really end up playing with it all that much, but I still love it. Bosium Strip. Mm. I also never really end up running this much because of the high mana cost. It's three colorless to get out. It's an artifact. And then you can pay three colorless and tap it until end of turn. If at any time the top card in your graveyard is an instant interrupt or sorcery card, you may play that card as though it were in your hand. If you do so, remove the card from the game. So you can get multiple uses out of an instant interrupt or sorcery, but it has to be at the top of your graveyard. And two, you have to have three mana plus however much mana you need to recast that instant interrupt or sorcery card available to you five probably well i always want to throw it in and i always want to take like a well maybe five i always want to put this in a counter burn style deck okay and you put your lightning bolts back then exactly That'd be good. so yes you have to pay five to reuse your counter spells potentially you play one casting you play like disrupt to one casting cost yeah yeah for spike uh but yeah i always want i always want to use it to get even more use out of my lightning bolts but i mean the great thing about lightning bolt is that it's three damage for one mana if you then use bosium strip to replay it you've yeah. now done six damage for four eight mana, mana. oh because i'm thinking about you have to cast you, oh, you the bosium cast strip. The, yeah cast the bosium strip for three play the first lightning bolt for one and then you activate the Bosium ship for three more. So that's seven. Yep. And then to replay your bolt, that's eight. So, and you're in a world where most of the time you, I mean, now there's every format you'll have, not every format, pre modern, you'll have incinerate and lightning bolt available to you, plus other less powerful 
direct damage spells like shock, but it's still two damage for one mana. You know, you, you never really need the Belzium strip at this point, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, with this and with Scri with Scrivener, I think I, I like them kind of as like a end game way to get back one of your clutch cards to use it one more time. And as such, I'm probably putting like just one in the deck, you know. That's kind of how, how I think about it, but I don't know. I might be wrong. I I think there's a reason most people don't play Bozium Strip because it is it's just too costly. You look at it, it's like this is an incredibly powerful effect, but it's just too costly. Second thing I learned about. Well, I knew Bozium Strip already, but I forgot about this card. Relearn. I know this. Yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. Originally printed in Weatherlight. I have one or two of these from Weatherlight. One colorless, two blue, sorcery. Return target, instant, interrupt, or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. I think this is obviously better than the Scrivener. Lower casting cost. I don't know. It doesn't have a body attached to it, but my thought is, again, you're not playing these town folks for the 2-2. Two -two. You're playing them yeah, for their so enter the battlefield effect. With that Scrivener, it's going to be kind of like a mid-game, mid to late game 2-2. Two -two. And it's like, eh, what is that going to help me at all at that point? It doesn't have probably synergy not. with other creatures. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, I like the relearn maybe more. 24 cents. I should pick I've up a couple of these. I've looked at this a few times in my box, but I've never like like felt compelled to put it in. Maybe I just haven't had the right deck. Or mm -hmm. <clears throat> It is a sorcery. So you can't use it to fish something out of your graveyard on your opponent's turn and then counter. But if you were going to do that, you'd still need like four to five mana available anyways, and that becomes an expensive counter. So, I don't know. I've also never played Relearn, but I kind of like I, it. I try it. And I do think it's probably better than the Scrivener if you want something with this effect. Next Retriever is Anarchist. Anarchist is a common from Exodus, also printed in Odyssey, also printed in Ninth Edition. Another expensive one, mana-wise. Four colorless, one red, summon townsfolk, 2-2. Two, two. When Anarchist comes into play, you may return target sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. Rating of 3.053 on Gatherer. Market price of nine cents, which that's about as cheap as we ever see a card get. <laughs> Nine cents for the non-foil. There were no... When did foils? There were no foil. Were there foils in Exodus? Yeah. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Versus I, the end of Versus. Yeah, that's right. I was going to say, uh, what can I pick up the foil for? I can't. Rarely does a card get this cheap. What could you run instead? If you wanted to bring a sorcery back, but you didn't want to pay five mana to bring out the 2-2 two -two Anarchist. Bosium strip again, relearn again. I think I just run relearn. I didn't find anything else in pre-modern or in old frame cards that I could use to bring back sorceries. Yeah. I was gonna say this, you know, this has the going for it that it's red, and there's probably nothing like that in red. I shouldn't say that, but uh very you know, little. I, yeah. Um, but yeah, like you said, still a lot of mana. It's going to be like pulling out a sorcery that you're going to use next turn mm -hmm. at best. So, recall and you see, you mentioned regrowth already. Regrowth can be used to bring anything back. I agree. Yeah. Recall, too. I haven't brought up, I, about, I haven't mentioned recall yet, but you can always use that. Okay. What about uh, Elven Cash? Now we're getting into <clears throat> heavier green, though. Is this sorcery? Is the right card? I might be thinking of the wrong card. Return yeah, target card. card from your graveyard to your hand. Hmm. Visions. Hmm. Okay. Four mana. Target card. Yeah. So if you really want to bring a sorcery back from your hand in red, you got to play Anarchist, I guess. Or you play the Bosium Strip. The fourth. 
the fourth retriever is cartographer this is the most well other than the black one maybe this is the most famous one that i know of this art so this um uh, scrapfall defaults to the odyssey one here the art is so good donato giancola oh yeah this the, is so good it is so good but we're gonna go to the original Cartographer, uncommon from Exodus, also printed as a common in Odyssey. Two colorless, one green, two two, summon townsfolk. When cartographer comes into play, you may return target land card from your graveyard to your hand. Now we're talking. This is my alley. This is the kind of card that I always want to play, but then I never end up playing. But this I, is weird. Sorry, go ahead. I spend most of my days thinking about what kind of decks can I build where I play land and then I play something else that requires for me to requires me to sacrifice land and then I have to play something else to bring the land back. Mm -hmm. I like to try to think about how to play extremely inefficient decks where I sacrifice land, bring land back. What were you gonna say, Alex? Um I forget. Uh I, I I've looked at this card a few times and like I know people play it like some I you know I know it has like decent like ratings and stuff. But I've looked at it and then like skipped past it. And now recently, because of some of the decks I've been messing with, it looks a lot more appealing to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why, if I just, yeah, wasn't thinking about the right thing. I think maybe part of me was thinking it said basic land instead of just it's any just land, yeah. which makes it a lot better. It does. Um, use this with your gemstone mine. Use it uh, after your mox diamond effects or... Uh, you know, like you said, oh, what, what the the red land destruction spell I've, I was playing with is just one casting cost. You have to sacrifice your own land. I don't remember. But this is a this has a rating of three point three nine three on Gatherer, ranked lower than Treasure Hunter, but I think it's the best of the cycle. Current market price of twenty two cents in Exodus, seventeen cents for Odyssey copy. I was thinking about this. I thought, yes, it can help you reverse the downside of cards that require you to sack a land. But three mana to reverse that downside is kind of expensive, I think. Especially when you're now down that land that you just had to sacrifice. So, you know, it's going to be turn four before you get to use this to bring back a land that you had to get rid of. You're still going to be behind in those critical early turns. But... It does say any land, target land. It's not just basic land. So I thought to myself, this is great to bring back lands with sacrifice effects back to your hand because usually those effects are super powerful. Like you could use this to re-waste land, you know? I can't think of any other lands right off the top of my head, but like strip mine, wasteland, you know, lands that you sack to destroy mm -hmm. their land, then you bring that back, destroy another land. Well, you know, people are happy to play pay three mana with a dust bowl to destroy a land. So, yeah, you know, why not, you know, cartographer your wasteland? I agree. So I think, I think that's in my mind right now, there's probably things you can do with this card that I'm not thinking of, but in my mind, that's its most powerful effect to bring back uh, land like strip mine or wasteland so then you can use again use it again on your opponent what else i also see this run in a couple different pre-modern decks sometimes cartographer shows up every once in a while i've seen it in terrageddon decks so there it's going to weaken your terror but it will help you build back faster after an armageddon so i think that's critical do you know Terravore, Alex? Are you familiar mm -hmm. with it? Okay, yeah. So yeah, you're gonna you're gonna remove a land from your graveyard. It's gonna make your Terravore less powerful. But yeah, if you can get in and build back from the Geddon, from the Armageddon faster than your opponent, I think that's worth it. I've also seen it in Astral Slide decks, which is a deck that I didn't know anything about until recently, and I still don't know much about it. Me but I know, I know that it runs Astral Slide, which I'll pull that up. 
<laughs> I just looked at this and I had to read it like three times because like I misunderstood it each time I read it. <laughs> Astral Side was originally printed in Onslaught. It's an uncommon. You can pick it up for 33 cents. Two colorless, one white enchantment. Whenever a player cycles a card, you may remove target creature from the game. If you do, return that creature to play under its owner's control at the end of the turn. So basically, I mean, you just use this to remove their creatures from the game temporarily for a turn every time they try to attack you or try to block something that you might be attacking with. It's mm -hmm. It seems like it's something that you can use to phase out their creatures. Yeah. Every time you cycle a card and the yeah, astral yeah. astral slide decks run a bunch of cycling cards including cycling lands. There's a series of cycling lands. That's what I was wondering about. I yeah. saw you mention that in here. Secluded step. I know I know I think I've seen Tranquil Thicket, but I'm not sure I know the other two names. Tranquil Thicket, Forgotten okay. Cave. I think these are all from the same set originally, which was Onslaught. So you cycle one of these lands, draw a card, bring it back with your cartographer, mm -hmm. draw a card again. Next time, you, if you choose to cycle it again, you know, it's it becomes like additional card draw, cartographer does in, in a deck with cycling lands. Yeah, I like the cycling lands. That's pretty cool. And I mentioned wasteland, and I mentioned you mentioned return a land you lost with Mox Diamond. So, yeah, those and are just some raise. Of the... So raise was the card I was I couldn't remember. It's one red. You destroy a land and sacrifice one of your own lands. Okay, okay. Those are some of the use cases I thought of for cartographer so far. I mean, I think it has the most diverse set of use cases out of the. Yeah, I might put this seen. in that red green land destruction I was playing with. So you could play with rays? Try it out. Yeah, is, well, is I have it... the rays in there already, and I have the harvest worms to pull my lands back out of the graveyard. When I was talking about Astral Slide, I said you could cycle something to phase out their creatures if they were attacking with you, attacking you, or phase out their creatures so they can't block what you're attacking them with. You can can you can you cycle? I think I'm assuming you can cycle during your opponent's turn too. I think so. I just assumed yeah you could play it at instant speed. That's what I think too. I know so little about cycling. The last card in the retriever's mega cycle. The reason this is a mega cycle and not just a standard cycle, is Grave Digger. Let me try that again. Grave Digger. This was originally printed in Tempest. It's, geez, there's so many printings of Grave Digger. A couple different arts. I like that Magic 20 art that was at the top. That was kind of neat. And I like the one at the bottom in Portal. It's weird. I didn't see that. I'll have to look at it again. Do you mean Magic 30? Was there? You said no, no, it was like twentieth edition. 20? Oh, twentieth edition. Okay. Yeah, they started changing it to you know like M twenty. Oh, M twenty. Okay, yeah. Twentieth edition. Grave Digger is uh, three colorless, one black. Summon zombie. Two two. When Grave Digger comes into play, you may return target creature card from your graveyard. To your hand, it has a rating of 3.865 on Gatherer, a current market price of 13 cents. I'm surprised it's so it's rated so high on Gather. I'm thinking maybe a lot of those ratings were put in before cards that were much better at this effect. Came and I think out. a lot of the comments on there sort of bear that out. They say things like, you know, used to be better, or I liked this a lot back in the day. And uh was it, wasn't reanimate also printed in Tempest? Yes. Yeah. I'll say yes. I mean, reanimate, you have like the best. Well, and you have around the same time several One other. Mana. One mana straight into play. Yeah, you lose the life, but it's one mana straight into play. Which, yeah. yes, it's rated much, much higher than Gravedigger, but I'm just surprised anybody played Gravedigger around this time. 
also around this time he had much less zombie synergy too so like it wasn't even that great that it was a zombie i was going to talk up its zombie synergy and be like you know that might be the thing that pushes it you know over the edge into the like making it into the deck Mm -hmm. Um, now potentially because it gets pumped by zombie things you could sacrifice it to things you need to sacrifice zombies to but there wasn't as much back in the tempest days there was uh i was gonna say there was no zombie lord but that's not true there was uh what was it what was the zombie what was the zombie guy from from alpha even was it zombie lord i think it is yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> zombie lord now you're making me blank on it no nope, no zombie lord damn it will you figure that out, alex Bring that out. Zombie Master? Zombie Zombie Master. Is that it? Zombie Master? I don't know if that's it. It is, yeah. This there is the is face. It. This is the face I we all know <laughs> and love. <laughs> One colorless, two black, two, three. Summon Lord. So he's a Lord. He is a zombie lord. He's a zombie master lord. All zombies in play game swamp walk and, re- and regenerate for one black for as long as this card remains in play. But this was before Lord of the Undead, which I think is the better zombie master because it gives all your zombies plus one plus one and you can return target zombie card from your graveyard to your hand. And there's a few more too that I I wasn't prepared for, but there's a few other similar zombie synergy cards like that. Um, I can't remember what their names are now. But anyways, Gravedigger... Don't think I play this, even though there's zombie synergy now with Lord of the Undead and other more modern zombie cards. Zombies are packed full of powerful cards. There's a lot of powerful zombie spells. Yeah. I mean, I've been thinking about zombies. We'll be talking about zombies in upcoming episodes. As all listeners of the Old Man Magic podcast know, I will be building a pre-modern zombie deck in late 2023, early 2024. And I don't think the Grave Day will make it into that zombie deck. There's just too many good zombies. But that's the end of the Retrievers, Alex. That's the end of the Retriever mega cycle. I see Cartographer making it into some decks. I'm going to build a Terrageddon deck at some point. It's going to be a suboptimal Terrageddon deck with no Mox Diamonds, but I'm, you know, who cares? I think that's probably the only retriever I actually put in a deck is the cartographer. But I'm glad I went through this cycle because it reminded me of our giving and find. And I might play around with relearn and some counterburn style decks to try to bring back some of those sorceries and instances and stuff. Is there anything you had to add when it comes to the retrievers? If not. I don't think so. I was still just looking at at Grave Digger. Um, Yeah, no, that's all. Oh, what was M20? I wanted to look at the M20 art because I uh, went past it pretty quick. I was just looking at other comments. Someone said, someone mentions that its casting cost makes it splashable. So that's nice. But I mean, that's, I mean, that's a million cards. I was just going to say that. Yeah. uh, It's in the same set as Entomb. And I don't know why they say that, because I don't think that's correct. That's not. Or the later reprinting of Grave Digger okay. would be in the same set as Entomb. Um, this is really cool art. The M20 art. Yeah. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Let's move on to segment two. Segment two is the Old Men Magic commander corner today we're going to make some revisions to our first ever commander decks that we built live here on the show not live but sort of live but not really live but we built them here on the show but before we do that i want to bring up an article that i found a couple days ago i'm pulling this up because now that my first ever commander deck is deck is built i said commander dick but I'm just going to power through. Commander, everybody knows what I meant. Now that my first ever commander deck is built, 
I need more, Alex. I can't stop at one commander oh. deck. That would be insane. This There's so many problem. cards out there that I can put into 100 card decks. I want to still say still say old frame though, at least mostly, probably with my entire deck. But definitely with my commander. So, I was looking around, I'm thinking what are some other old frame commanders? I can go with. For my first deck, I really wanted to go with an original legend. That's why I picked Jacques Lavert, because I wanted to go legends only. It wasn't completely in the original spirit of EDH, because I didn't choose an actual Elder Dragon, but I did choose one of the original legendary characters. Here I want to say old frame, but I'm going to go a little bit newer than legends. I don't I don't need to stick with like an original legends card. I found this article. There are lots of articles out, out there like this going over old frame commanders. This one is from CBR.com, written by Declan Lothian, MTG, 10 best commanders from Magic's early years. And I started scrolling through this. <clears throat> and number 10 caught my eye. I saw I stopped right there. At the first one. Atogatog. -atog. Number 10. Atogatog -atog isn't super strong, but it is oh so cool. We all know Atogs from back in uh, antiquities. Atogs are small gremlin-like creatures in magic that devour other types of cards to power their abilities. Oratog eats enchantments. That's currently in my Metally Merfolk deck. Oratog eats forests. Atogatog, -atog, of course, eats other Atogs. Increasing in power and toughness equal to that of the creature devoured. This five color commander makes for a great Atog tribal deck, which is made possible by the number of changelings now in the game. A Tog Atog may not be the most powerful option for an old commander, but it is sure to draw some attention at the table. <laughs> so let's pull up a Tog Atog right here. Right here, right now. Let's say too. A Tog. A Tog. Easy to spell. A togatog. A togatog. A togatog is a legendary creature. It's an atog. One white, one blue, one black, one red, one green. It's a five color commander. Creature, atog legend, five, five. You sacrifice an atog. A, a togatog gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the sacrifice. Atogs. Ability, it's a rare from Odyssey. It has no reprints. It's a dollar and three cents. It has a current rating of 3.865 on Gatherer. I first, when I saw this, I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to build just kind of like a fun, goofy commander deck. A commander deck where you sit down at the table and you don't immediately become a target. People kind of want to let you do your thing for a little while, potentially, to see what happens with your a toga tog. So that's good. You're not necessarily a target. It seems like it could be a fun time. Weird things could happen. Uh, I like the fact that it's a five color deck because you can put all your a togs in, but then you can choose all of your favorite spells from all the other uh, colors of magic. You can make it kind of like a five color good stuff deck as long as while limiting your card selections to cards that only most of the time probably use one of a colored mana, like a Swords of Plowshares, a Giant Growth, a Lightning Bolt. If you're going to go with counter spells, pick like a one colorless, one blue counter variant, stuff like that, just so you can cast the spells. I started rambling a little bit. I don't know where I was going with that, but the next thing I wanted to say is I first thought, how many Atogs are there? How many Atogs could you actually put into a deck to feed a Togatog? Well, there are more than I realized. There's the original Atog. There's Ortog, which we mentioned already. There's Chronotog from Visions, which I knew about. Mm -hmm. Foratog, which we mentioned. Lithotog, which is a pretty cool one. Uh, one colorless, one red, one green, one two. Sacrifice a land to give it plus one, plus one until end of turn, which I don't want to do most of the time. But you can also sacrifice an artifact to give it plus one, plus one until end of turn, which in a world of treasure tokens seems 
Not so bad. Megatog, which is not an old frame Atog, so I probably won't be running this one. I think that's, yeah, that's Mirrodin. Sacrifice an artifact. Megatog gets plus three, plus three, and Trample. So that could be a big beater. There is Necrotog. Remove the top creature card in your graveyard from the game. Give it plus two, plus two until end of turn. Fantatog. So there was this group of, group of them from Odyssey. Odyssey had Fantatog. Sacrifice an enchantment to give it plus one, plus one. Or discard a card from your hand. Give it plus one, plus one. Psychotog, which we've talked about many times. This is the one that gets a big play. Discard a card from your hand to give it plus one, plus one. Or remove two cards in your graveyard from the game to give it plus one, plus one. Sarkatog, remove two cards in your graveyard from the game to give it plus one plus one or sacrifice an artifact, which if Psychotog gets so much play, why doesn't Sarkatog get any play? Let me think about that for a second. Because the thing I like about Psychotog is that you take cards that are already in your graveyard, you get additional value out of them when you feed them to the Psychotog. Mm -hmm. Now you can do the same thing with Sarkatog. Yeah, I think with Psychotog, you can also just, like, empty some stuff out of your hand for the Killing Blow, too. Um, and then Sarkatog, you'd need to make sure you have some artifacts around. Yeah, But, like you said, treasure tokens, things that... Make... That's what I'm thinking about, treasure tokens. But Psychotog has combos that I see with it in old frame formats and in pre-modern, like, you know, upheaval to bring everything back and then you pitch it. Yeah. Pitch them to the Psychotog. You really have to replay the Psychotog, but then you can pitch everything I think being able to use your hand and your graveyard allows for more like triggery. Yeah. But if you're playing in a format where you can generate treasure tokens, I mean, uh -huh. is Sarkatog. Your Ornithopter deck. Under, exactly, or Ornithopter deck. Thaumatog, sacrifice a land or sacrifice an enchantment. I don't love the ones where you have to sacrifice a land. That's that's harder. That's harder. You know, I'm behind. looking at Fantatog and I'm thinking. You could like kill some of your own enchantments to trigger things in an enchantment deck. Or you just bring play it back in a with... deck where you have a lot of it, you know. Might not be bad. Yeah, and you can bring them back with an replenish and you know play and sack them again, potentially. But you know, they're ATOG. They all have downsides. Uh they're not all great, but they're all decent they all can be pumped in different ways that could be difficult for opponents to deal with in combat if you have a lot of ways to pump things people might not want to attack you as often uh well, and there's so many of them there's just more to feed to a togatog than i realized and, and what i like is when you're doing all these at once you can basically since they all have different sacrifice effects you're the, you, you can just sacrifice anything any kind of your permanence to make yeah. a togs bigger and then feed them to the bigger one or just or not you know uh but it gives you yeah versatility in your sacrificing you know combine this with some stuff that brings stuff back from your graveyard you can make some sweet sacrificing chains It'd be fun so interesting i also think to myself if you play this Atagatog -Atag deck your your win con is probably to win via commander damage that's what I'm assuming. So with the Atagatog -Atag that's already 5-5, five, five, you can make it. I mean, you could make this guy really big. It yeah. wouldn't be too hard to make him that big. Yeah, and if, if you, you could empty also... your graveyard to the Psychotog and then yeah. sack him to the... Yeah. And then if you could also like strap something to him that gives him trample. Yeah. I mean, now we're talking. Berserk him. Berserk him. Rancor him. Armadillo cloak him. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. So I thought this was looking interesting. This is looking interesting. All these different ATOGs. That article that we just read mentioned changelings. Changeling is a characteristic defining keyword ability. It only appears on shapeshifter cards and grants those cards all creature types. They were first inch featured in the Lorwyn block. The design was based on Mistform Ultimus, which we mentioned briefly in a previous episode. Yeah. You were thinking about changelings at some point when you were building your five-color deck. I looked up all the changelings on Scryfall. 
And a lot of them are new frame. So I wouldn't necessarily be playing them if I wanted to keep this an old frame only deck, but there's still quite a few uh, old frame options too. Anthroplasm. We go through some others. Dermoplasm, Drownu's Pet, Dracoplasm, which we love Dracoplasm, mm -hmm. Ex Escaped Shapeshifter, Glowstone Sculpture. So again, these aren't all necessarily great on their own, but it's like these are more cards that can be Atogs that can then be fed to a Togatog. Halfdane, yeah. I got excited about this. If I play this deck, I will definitely be playing Halfdane because original legend creature. Love those. Got to play them. Some of these are quite good too, but uh, you know, if they're new frame, I'm just going to stay away from them for now. I don't have anything against the new frame cards again, but I don't want to have to start buying new frame cards too while I'm also trying to build my old frame collection. Morphling is a shapeshifter, a great card that uh, could make its way into the Atagatog deck. I could play Sentinel from Legends and Chronicles. Don't know why I'd do that, but I could. Shifty Doppelganger from Odyssey. Two colors, one blue, one one. You can pay three colors and one blue, remove shift, Shifty Doppelganger from the game, put a creature card from your hand into play. That creature gains haste until end of turn. At end of turn, sacrifice that creature. If you do return Shifty Doppelganger to play. That's kind of cool. I've never seen this card before, but essentially you could play Shifty Doppelganger and then play any creature card with haste from your hand for one turn for four mana. It's like sneak attack. That's very shifty, Alex. I'm trying to find the stack of cards I had. They are there are several cards in Onslaught there, I believe, where yeah, like there's a few different mist form cards, mist form dreamer, mm -hmm. mist form, there's a wall, and then there's um image crafter you can use to change creatures to a different type. Like image crafter is one blue, one one, and you tap him to choose a creature type other than legend or wall, target creatures type becomes that type until end of turn. So if you have other creatures you want to add that aren't ATOGs, you could play with Image Crafter and then turn them into ATOGs when you want to. Yeah. But you have to have the Image Crafter in your hand. You, know, you have to be able to, to draw and play the Image Crafter in order to do Yeah, I mean, like, I wouldn't be relying those. on this, but, yeah. like, if you already have a bunch of ATOGs in your deck, you know, then you could have an Image Crafter and you could have maybe, like, a few other creatures that you have for other reasons. Yeah. Know. I would like to use this, uh, like, maybe you slide some uh, creature theft spells into your Atagatog deck to take things from your opponent. Oh, yeah, okay, right. And then you could always use the Image Crafter to change them into something, sack them to the Atagatog. Yeah, that's a good idea. This card has an interesting combo I was just looking at. I don't know if you want me to go off on a tangent here, but... Go on a tangent. Interesting interaction. Uh I have a deck with this in it. I'm going to try against you. But there's a card called Artificial Evolution. Look that one up. It does a really similar thing. I think I made a typo. Okay. Thought I was wrong about what it was called, maybe. Typo. <laughs> Crab people. So this is basically an instant version of the ability on Image Crafter. Okay. But there's a little difference. You change the text, okay? Change the text of target spell or permanent by replacing all instances of one creature type with another. The new creature type can't be legend wall. In the errata for this, it says when it changes, it changes text in the text box and the creature type on the creature type line. So you can change this to directly change a creature type or to change how they refer to a creature type in the text box, right? Okay. So if I use this on Image Crafter, I figured this out myself. I was very proud. Very proud. You should be. Okay. You should be out. I can use artificial evolution 
to change the part on Image Crafter where it says Legend or Wall to now say something other than Legend or Wall. Okay. So I could change the text on Image Crafter to say Legend or Goblin. And now I can use my Image Crafter to turn anything into a wall because its text no longer says you can't. That's incredible, Alex. <laughs> Or a legend, if you want to turn something into a legend. You could use that combo to use Image Crafter to turn things into the previously prohibited legends or walls. I was going to say, is this card modern legal? If it was modern legal, you could you could build an all old frame modern legal deck, bring it to your local modern RCQ. You could blow people's minds with that. You could, you could spike a local modern RCQ. But no, this is not modern legal. You're going to have to do it in a pre-modern tournament. Yeah. I'm Not splashing it into, I'm making a black blue cleric deck actually. I'm okay. Use that to change things to, into clerics. What is crab people from? Crab people, crab. What, <laughs> I don't know what that am one. I thinking of? That's <laughs> from something, right? Crab people, crab people. I'm like a. I, I mean, I like it's it. It's not from like Futurama or something? Not ringing a bell. Okay. <laughs> But, uh, I'm gonna go on a tangent. <clears throat> Crab people chant. South Park. South Park. So, so okay. I don't know if I ever saw that one. Crab people song. Okay. Crab people song South Park. Crab. Okay. I knew it wasn't crazy. Anywho. That's a, a brief discussion about the next uh, legendary card that I'm thinking about building my second commander deck around uh, a Togatog. And I got to pay somebody to, to modify the card for me to put a Toga on the oh, Togatog. It's a good idea. I'm blanking on the word. It's a very basic word I can't think of right now. Not I don't want the card modified. I want to buy a altered card. Okay. Toga a toga toga. Alex, if you don't have anything else to say about Commander, we can get into the second part of the Open Magic Commander Corner where we review our first ever Commander decks that we now officially have built up to 100 cards, and then we can make a few minor mods, because I know we both had a couple things that we wanted to to take out and and add into the deck after we spent some time looking at our finished products. We have some modifications we want to make. So I'll pull up mine first, I suppose. My first ever Commander deck. It is called the pump. It is old frame only. My commander is Jacques Lever. He pumps all of my green creatures plus zero plus two. All of my creatures in this deck are either green or gold with the green mana. I have a lot of other things in this deck that can pump my creatures further. That is why it is named the pump. It is named the pump because I was inspired by a scene from Pumping Iron, a 1970s documentary by with Arnold Schwarzenegger in it, where he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Lou Ferrigno. He was coming back to capture his fifth, I think, Mr. Olympia title. Lou was the up-and-comer, the scrappy youngin' from the Bronx coming to take his title. He failed. Schwarzenegger was triumphant. But I also have Kaza to pump my green creatures. Gives all green creatures I control plus one plus one. I have other things in this deck that can pump my creatures. I have Wyoli Wolf. I can tap Wyoli Wolf to give any creature in play plus one plus one until end of turn. With Stampede Driver, I can discard a card from my hand. All creatures I control get plus one plus one and gain trample until end of turn. Mystic Enforcer has Threshold, gets plus three plus three in flying if I have seven or more cards in my graveyard. Forgotten Ancient can get pumped every time a player plays a spell. I may put a plus one, plus one counter on Forgotten Ancient. As Mirror Holy Avenger can be pumped. 
She's a 2-3 flyer, but the end of each turn put a plus one, plus one counter on Esme or Holy Avenger for each creature put into my graveyard that turn. Come all Fist of Croza can pump my creatures. He's a 4-3 creature druid legend, but if I pay two colorless and three green creatures, I control get plus three, plus three, and gain trample until end of turn. He is an overrun on a stick. What else pumps in this deck, Alex? Giant Growth pumps, Invigorate pumps, Berserk pumps, Power Matrix can pump my creatures, Armadillo Cloak can pump my creatures, Gerard's Battle Cry pumps, Marari's Wake gives creatures I control plus one plus one, Ranker can pump. Alex, you what? suggested you suggested once that I take out my legendary land. No, I didn't. No, I, didn't. No, I didn't say that. Which out. I can tap to give all my one one creatures plus one plus two until end of turn. I lost my shit. When you said that, I would never take the Pendlehaven out of, of the pump. I think that's about all I have in this deck. It pumps other creatures. When I was reviewing this deck, I thought to myself, should I add Enlightened Tutor? This is a question I have. Enlightened Tutor, you can use to tutor for enchantments and artifacts i don't really have a lot of enchantments and artifacts in this deck but i do have goblin bombardment in this deck which is a card that i'm really liking it is one colorless one red enchantment sacrifice a creature goblin bombardment deals one damage to target creature or player in addition to having a lot of spells in this deck that pump my creatures that make them bigger I have some token generation cards in here too. Like I have a lot of different ways to generate tokens. I have some sorceries that can help me generate tokens. I have some removal spells that get rid of an enchantment or an artifact and also give myself sapling tokens. I have cards like uh, Hazes on Tamar and Deranged Hermit that generate creature tokens. Essentially, if the game lasts for a little while and the deck's working all right, I should have a lot of tiny little creatures that I could potentially fling my opponent's way via Goblin Bombardment to either deal direct damage to them and potentially end the game or to get rid of pesky creatures they may have on their side. So I was thinking I could also potentially use it for removal. I don't have a lot of flying creatures in this deck. So if I'm having difficulty with a flyer, I could use Goblin Bombardment to knock something on my opponent's side out of the sky. Mm -hmm. So this was a question I had. Should I add Enlightened Tutor? If I added an Enlightened Tutor, what would I even get? Second thing I thought is, I would still like to add more creatures. I'm considering Tempting Listen. So those are the two things I wanted to put in. Enlightened Tutor, Tempting Listen. We talked about Tempting Listen last mm -hmm. episode. A lot of different reasons why. I think yeah, I think that's a cool card in here. Two, two cards to put in, that means I need to remove two cards. What do I take out? I think I'm going to take out a card that I put in pretty early on that I found when I was prepping for our episode on card draw on green. And it's collective, con collective unconscious. I do really like this card. It is straight up card draw in green. But it is very high casting cost. It's four colors, two green. And you get to draw a card for each creature you control. And I've been goldfishing this deck, messing around with it here and there. And if I'm generating tokens, it's hard to know how well this card will work in my deck when I'm actually in a four-player game and I'm facing a lot of removal. I don't know. But when I'm just play testing it, I'm afraid of the number of times in which I might end up drawing like 12 cards because of all the small token creatures I have. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's great if you draw 12 cards, but you've paid six mana to cast this spell. So you don't have a whole lot of mana left over to cast anything that you might've just drawn. So yeah. you're going to be pitching a lot of cards. And yes, you get to refill your hand. Who cares if you discard a bunch of them, if you load it up with seven cards that you really oh, want. I'm with you. I think you're right. It's it's going to be a little unwieldy in this in the deck you've built. It might you know be tough to use it at the right time without hurting yourself. 
I think too much is going to end up in the graveyard. And I think nature's resurgence, which I put in after I added collective unconscious, serves a similar purpose and actually works better in this deck. So nature's resurgence is two colorless, two green sorcery. Each player draws a number of cards equal to the number of creature cards in his or her graveyard. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to give everybody, it's going to give everybody cards, but. I'm 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 banking on having a more creature heavy deck than my opponents. I don't know. I understand. You know, now I'm saying this out loud and I almost want to remove nature's resurgence instead. Because it gives my opponent. You know what though? More it's commander. I, I gotta do some nice things. It's not so bad if I do something nice for my opponent. It's sometimes. Yeah. Maybe I'll be like, you guys gotta keep me around. There's a nature's resurgence in here. It can't show up any turn. Don't get rid of me yet. I could help you out next turn. You never well, helping one, helping some of your opponents can hurt the other opponents, you know? That is true. So I'm taking out the nature's resurgence. No, I'm taking out the collective unconscious. <laughs> and I'm adding an enlightened tutor. Cool. So you're going bye-bye. Remove. You have been stricken. Enlightened Tutor's going in. I might regret this. I might take it out in the future. But I think I want to go for that bombardment. I think I want to bombard. Where is the tutor? Where did you go? Right here. Mirage. I'm switching printings to the Mirage printing. The tutors were some of the first things that I bought when I started buying magic cards when I got back into the game again. And they've halved in price since I bought them. Excellent purchase, Steve. So what else did I say I wanted to add? I said I wanted to add tempting listen. What do I take out in place of tempting listen? Well, I wanted to just add more creatures to the deck in total, but I was looking at all the non-creature spells and I just don't, have anything that I really want to take out yet. There's nothing I want to remove. So I went through the creatures and I found this heart warden. And I'm not even sure why I put the heart warden in earlier. Now that I'm looking at the deck as it stands, I don't think I need a two mana manimal. Yeah. There's some card draw. I could sacrifice it to draw a card later in the game. If I want that card draw ability, maybe I just put in Moltani's Acolyte instead. I considered putting Moltani's Acolyte. I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to remove Heart Warden. Heart Warden is one colorless, one green, one one. Tap to add one green mana to your mana pool. Or pay two colorless and sacrifice it to draw a card. I'm taking that guy out. Because it just doesn't seem critical. Like, it's not bad. It's all right there, but not needed. Tempting Lissid. Tempting Lissid could potentially help me finish an opponent. So I've added the Tempting Lissid. Oh, I'll leave it in there. Other thing I considered removing, I'm not doing it yet, but I'm considering it, is Gerard's Battle Cry. I like it because it's just one white. And it gives all my creatures plus one, plus one. And if I have a horde of creatures out, you know, just giving everything plus, just playing three mana to give everything plus one, plus one might be really, really good if the game lasts long enough. If I'm able to generate enough tokens to actually go wide. I wonder what the cheapest spell that does that as a one-off is. Yeah, it might actually be better to have it as a one-off. There's one that's just like a one or maybe even a two casting cost spell. I like the fact that I could use this to do to give more than plus one plus one, but yeah, it's not just colorless mana. So if I want to give plus two plus two, I need two white and two colorless. That's what I was gonna say. Like, how often are you gonna give? Or are you gonna use the effect on that more than once, like in a turn? I don't know. Late in the game, maybe. Yeah, it's gonna. I think I might be dead a lot of the times before I'm able to do that. So I don't know. I'm considering taking that out. But yeah, I should look into like what spells just have that effect as a one-off. There's overrun, but that's a high mana cost. 
Overrun is trample on plus three plus three. I think it's like six or seven mana, maybe, maybe even more. Let me pull it up real quick. Overrun. Two colors, three green. Plus three, plus three, and trample on to one to turn. Consider it. I'm considering it. Okay, but that's the current status of the pump. I've reviewed Very the pump. Good. I have considered various cards in the pump. I have removed two cards from the pump, and I've added two cards in their place. I'm very excited one day about putting my tempting Lissid on my Elven Warhounds and then attacking somebody and they have to put all of their creatures back on top of their deck. And all they can do for the next five turns is just replay things that they already played. Yeah, that's a good combo. I like it. Anywho, you're up, Alex. Did you have changes you wanted to make? To group mud. <clears throat> I don't know if you had any changes you wanted to make or not. I mean, I have some, but I haven't looked at what I want to take out yet. Um, well, that's a problem. Can you, set, can you set this to public so that I can view it without no. logging into your account? You can. <laughs> set it to public so I can see. I can, but you can also just sign in with the uh, with the uh, with our Moxfield password. No, because then it wants no, Steve. Then it wants to send you a text message. Moxfield does that too. Yeah, I, I mean, I know like Gmail does and Twitter. Okay. Maybe I'll make not. it public. I'll try it again. I'll make it public. I think you might be lying about that. I think you'd be wrong. Yeah, I might be I might be mistaken. You could always just tell me the cards you want to add, and then you have like 102 cards or 103 cards we could cut later. Yeah, let's do that. Because I haven't decided what I'm going to take out yet for sure. Um one thing I wanted to add was a lotus blossom. Since a I'm Lotus playing a defensive blossom? deck, this will allow me to build up some mana and a, and a specific mana of a kind that I need over a period of a few turns. And I can use it to cast one of my red spells or one of my things that I can't otherwise cast. Switching to the original printing. Urza Saga, 279. The weakest of all Lotuses. <laughs> Okay. Okay to defensive deck though, I think. You know, like no, it's not, it's not, keep building. Yeah, it's not not bad. Um another card I was really thinking about was Bequeathal. I'd like to try to fit this in. Good card draw and has a defensive ability. This this is the problem I did. There's an extra A in there. Q U E A. Who there we go. I knew that, but I wanted to see if you would catch it. <laughs> <laughs> Bequeathal. Bequeathal. It's a one green enchantment, creature enchantment, and when the creature dies, I get I draw two cards. Um and that'll be good. I think I like the idea of like putting that on something like my Forgotten Ancient that I'm gonna have growing. And then that way people are like, oh, maybe I don't want to kill it because he gets to draw two cards. So it's kind of like a defensive thing on one of my creatures and some card draw. Um yeah. I could so have put we'll that on my uh what was the I just what was the heart warden, the mana elf that I just removed from my That deck. sounds right. Uh where you pay two cards and you sacrifice it to draw a card. You bequeath all that, you draw three cards. True. For yeah. three mana. Mm -hmm. Plus the two mana that you had to pay to play the creature originally. Not that great. Anyways. <laughs> Talking through it. Talking through it. Okay, then. Okay. Alex, I think that brings us to the end of episode 58 of the Old Man Page Magic Podcast. We talked about how we want to potentially build some decks that are both old school and modern legal or pre-modern and modern legal to help us dip our toes into the modern world. We talked about the Retriever's Mega Cycle from Tempest and from Exodus. We talked about the next commander deck I might want to build around a Toga Talk. And we revised our first ever old frame commander decks. 
And now I have nothing else to talk about today. If you have listened to us this long, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give us a like, hit the notification bell. If you're listening on audio only, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Those are the platforms we're on. Alex, do you have anything to add before we uh, head out for the day? I think so, Steve. Uh, I don't think so. Nothing at all. Okay, then. It's up to you. That's all you're going to bring to the table, Alex, or whatever. You don't have to prepare anything for the end of the show. Every episode, you know that the show's going to end. And I'm going to be like, oh, do you have anything else to add? But if all you want to say to viewers is, I don't have anything to add, that's fine with me, whatever. Okay, everybody. Talk to you next week.